Welcome to another episode of Pod for Good, a podcast where we learn from those doing good in Tulsa why they care, what we can do, and most importantly, what you can do. Pod for Good is produced and edited by Random Productions and can be found anywhere you get your podcasts. I'm your chief philanthropod, Jesse Ulrich. And I'm your vice admiral philanthropod, Chris Miller. Today we talk to the vice president of diversity, equity, inclusion for the Tulsa Regional Chamber of Commerce, Kuma Roberts. We talked to Kuma about how she accidentally became a DEI expert. She gets real with us about her own microaggression, and she tries to sell us on blacksmith-based reality shows. Enjoy. All right, we are very excited to have Kuma Roberts on the podcast. Good evening, Kuma. Hello, how are you all? Doing good. (laughs) It's still weirdly warm out. And uh, I don't know strange. how to feel about that. It is very strange that it's warm out. I, I, I don't know whether to pull out the coats or pull out the shorts. I, my son looks weird every time he goes to school. He's wearing shorts on one half, long sleeve shirt on the top. I got so. warm. I got very warm raking leaves, which just felt wrong <laughs> it, by yeah. nature over the weekend. <laughs> so <Right>? in November. <laughs> yes. But enough leaf talk. This isn't yeah. leaf for good. Uh, <laughs> this is pod for good. So Wouldn't it be pod for leaves? Probably. <laughs> probably. Sorry. Uh, n- n- now I need to make that design just so I can see it. So you are you are currently the vice president of diversity, equity, inclusion for the Tulsa Regional Chamber, correct? Yes, that is correct. So, and f- first technical question: At one point, you were also the executive director of diversity, equity, and inclusion for the Tulsa Regional Chamber. Mm-hmm. Why the why the <laughs> the title shift? That's really interesting. So I've been at the chamber for almost 10 years now, and I've been dying to be a a vice president at the chamber. And they kept saying, well, executive director is the same as vice president. It just means that you have a program under you. You run Mosaic. And I was like, okay, I'm finally comfortable with that. Okay, I'm executive director. And then in January, just this past January, they said, you're the vice president of diversity, <laughs> equity, and inclusion. And that was apparently a, an upgrade that I'd been told wasn't an upgrade. So uh, really, there's no difference. <laughs> okay. I mean, uh, Chris and I have talked about this many times because he works at Bank of Oklahoma, as does my sister. <laughs> and their way of making everyone vice presidents at, at a certain point is just... Like, it's just what uh, it is. It, it becomes meaningless at a certain point <laughs> if everyone's a vice president. That's it. Uh, I, I yeah. am now a vice president. I get to say that. But the work has not changed. It is mm-hmm. still the same. And uh, yeah, so that's that story. <laughs> so, so speaking of that, okay, so you have the program Mosaic. Yes. But then you're also the vice president of diversity and inclusion. So yes. is Mosaic the way that you actually, the implementation of diversity and inclusion, or are they kind of two parts of the, of the same job? Probably two parts of the same job. Mosaic is our coalition of pro- nonprofit and corporate partners who celebrate diversity, champion equity, and cultivate inclusion in the workplace. It's been around since 2011, so much longer. I mean, almost about the time I've been at the chamber. It's been around for that long. Um, we like to say it's our external vehicle for promoting the region as inclusive and diverse and equitable. Um, the other part of the job as vice president is being that person for the chamber. How do we advance chamber strategy toward diversity, equity, inclusion? Who's auditing our hiring and recruiting practices? How are we embracing equity in our legislative effort and our attraction and retention of companies to the region? So it's kind of like two different hats, same beast. But, but according to uh, Mosaic's website, you are executive director of Mosaic, not vice president of Mosaic, correct? <laughs> Who knows? It's all, all right. the same thing. It's all the same thing. I thought it was a thing, but it's not. It's just the same. <laughs> well, you, you just need to put those together. Executive vice president director yeah. uh, of exactly. Mosaic right. and in yeah. diversity and inclusion. I yeah. was executive director of talent attraction, retention, and Mosaic for a few years. I see that too. too. Yeah. <laughs> how, about, uh, how, how about this? How about... Uh, director, comma, vice president, uh, comma. Wait, no, no, sorry, executive, comma. No, anyway, I'll figure that <laughs> That's out. That's too I'll, many commas. I'll, 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 yeah, I'll figure that out in post. Um, yeah. So yeah, but you you've been with the chamber for a very long time, like uh, much longer than I've ever stayed at any job I've ever had in my life. <laughs> Um, is that the millennial thing that happens? No, it's mostly just my own mental boredom own at a certain thing. point. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, as I've told many people, it takes me about nine months to learn everything about a job. And mm-hmm. until I do that, I don't and know if I'm actually ten months to get enjoyed. bored with it? <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know if I like the job or not until I've learned everything about it. Uh, so, 
As wow. long as I'm learning something, I'm enjoying myself. That's a so. pretty good learning curve, nine months. It took me at least two years to really figure out Chamber World. So you're doing I mean, so well. I, I, I could be wrong. And it's just like, I, uh, <laughs> There's always you know, a little months, bit more to learn. <laughs> at nine months, I think you know enough to be dangerous, but not you don't really know everything. Right. You could still claim, you know, plausible deniability. Yeah. Uh-huh. I uh, started it at the chamber. I was applying to be in um, the sports commission as a receptionist. And I got to the number two spot and they didn't hire me. They must have gone back. Ray Hoyt, who's now head of the sports commission, he must have gone back and said something about me because they hired, they called and created a position called uh, resource development specialist. <laughs> whatever that is. I was just happy that it didn't say receptionist in the title. I thought I was really like, I'm a specialist now. Essentially, I answered phones <laughs> and greeted guests who came into the office. So it was a, it was a great job. So uh, I did that for a while, quickly moved into events and communications. Um, and then the bulk of my time at the chamber was in education, where I was uh, the program manager for Partners in Education, which is like a beloved program that was around forever. And I got to be the liaison between the public school system and the business community. And then I went talent traction and workforce and now diversity. So that's my whole trajectory with the chamber. So the chambers had the problem with titles since you got there forever forever okay. it's just like they're just making them up really <laughs> yeah <laughs> i mean so okay so when you were doing the talent attraction retention and mosaic mm-hmm. that seems like three separate entities so <laughs> how did they how did you rope that into one position well, it had always been done that way. And I, it's sad to say that we'd always had someone who did um, the division I worked in was workforce and education. So essentially, um, they added DNI to the workforce role. Because when people talk about diversity, and certainly back then, it was always in the terms of we're looking for diverse candidates for workforce, we're looking to hire where we can't retain our diverse candidates. So it seemed to fit in the workforce realm for for quite a while. And my predecessor um, was doing it that way. Then I think they realized that it was it was indeed three different positions. And so I think ultimately one day, literally one day in November, two years ago, I went into the office doing my work as talent attraction, retention mosaic. And they said, you don't do workforce anymore. Bye bye. You are now solely over the diversity piece. And that's what we want you to do moving forward. And so they uh, separated it, moved that into economic development. And I've been doing diversity and inclusion ever since. So I would say that in general, when people think of the the Chamber of Commerce, they don't, the first thing they think of isn't diversity. They <laughs> probably have a very particular picture of the people who were involved. It's usually older white executives of companies. Yeah. yeah. So what is it like trying to, I don't know, change the culture as well as the perception of that? It's been kind of fun. <laughs> it's been it's been it's been one of the most interesting challenges. I do a lot of presentations around town and I have this picture basically it's like I don't know, a boardroom from 1930s or something. And it's all just a bunch of white men around a boardroom table. I said, this is what you think of when you think of the chamber, right? And most people agree. It, it, it is a predominantly white male organization. Chambers seem to have that. But our chamber has been chamber of the year four different times. It's a very progressive chamber in the sense that they have lots of women in leadership and, um, And like I said, Mosaic has been around since 2011. So at least since then, they've known the value and importance of um, thinking about diversity, equity, and inclusion. So it's been a great badge of pride for me to be able to say we're different. And so that's what's really set us apart. We just recently won Chamber of the Year for 2020, in part due to our diversity, equity, and inclusion work. And so I think people are coming around to see that chambers can be active participants in minority uh, communities and doing doing good work. And that's what we want. And regardless of the whiteness of the room, I think people have great intentions. And if they work um, to really fix the ills of society, then that's what matters. I'm not really worried that there's not like a 50-50 room of diverse candidates and white guys. As Chris and I point out pretty much in every podcast we do these days, like as two white guys, we have questions. <laughs> and <laughs> while like technically we are like religiously diverse, as Chris is a, a lax Catholic and I'm a lax Jewish person. Got it. <laughs> I, I have a question about terms because I feel like DNI is, DNI is the... <laughs> the 
abbreviation, right? Yes, right. But diversity that's leaving out one and inclusion. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I feel like it used to be diversity and inclusion and then equity was added at some point. Yeah. And I'm just curious, like, obviously, like that, that was like a sort of a probably national sort of thing when it happened. But I'm curious about like how important it is to include all three versus two. Like, was there a difference when you started calling it a diversity, equity and inclusion? Yeah, it, there really was a difference. So yes, when I started in the role, it was kind of over D and I and and that's kind of how we languaged it. And, and, um, and then uh, I, and I started doing more work in terms of the race massacre and, and working a little bit more in a community I grew up in, North Tulsa, and talking with people. And it began to be for me around equity. Like how do we um, ec- you know, treat, talk about education and equity and access to education? How do we talk about economic development and equity? And so it was really important for me to add equity to my title. And not only that, to add it into the chamber strategy. It wasn't something, I think right now, I think before that, they had just started thinking about like, how diverse is the room? You know, what does it look like when you come to a chamber event? Is it diverse? Does that feel right? Instead of are we advocating from a legislative standpoint on things that push more equity into North Tulsa or marginalized communities? Uh, Are we thinking about our attraction about companies that benefit people of color? Like we, we just hadn't had those kinds of conversations. So there was a huge shift when we did that and we added equity into the title and into our strategic plan specifically to address those issues. Can you explain to our listeners the difference between equity and equality? Was this a Marcia question? No, no. no, That that, that, uh, (laughs) That that sounds like a Marcia question. It does, doesn't it? It does. I channel her sometimes. Uh, Apparently (laughs) she does an impression of me that we need to get recorded (laughs) at some point. But Uh, We need to stop turning this into pod for Marcia. Apart from Marcia, right? Mm -hmm. I I would would be on that any day. Equality is the end state, right? To me, equality is what we all say we strive for, where we truly are treated as equals. Equity to me is that is the vehicle by which we get to there. It's how we're thinking about equity in education, in workforce, in um, in this. It's the systems work that's required to get us to a true state of equality. And so that's the best definition that I have in terms of um, explaining that to you. So, like, so equity in education, for example, means that to to make education equal for everyone requires mm-hmm. at a certain point one one subsection of schools to get more money than another to right. make them equal. Right. Or better okay. teachers, more better, better teachers than another, because we know that they're coming from a significant um, difference. You know, recently I did an exercise with Leadership Tulsa where um, we were talking about the difference between equity and equality. And I had them write their concerns and fears on a piece of paper. And they were all scattered around this room. It's one of those rare in-person events that we don't get to do anymore, but we had an in-person event. And I said, okay, whoever can get their fear or question into this bucket, um, I'm going to address those the next time we come together. And the people way in the back were like, what? What about us? We're, we're not, there's no way we can shoot our, our, you know, our question to you and make it in that bucket. And all the people up front, of course, could just lob them in. And I said, that's the difference, right? Uh, uh, you know, you guys are all have a shot. That's equality. Everyone gets a shot. But equity is the fact that those of you in the back, are shooting from a far, far, you know, less position than those who are at the front. And so they were like, oh, okay, that makes sense. So anyway. That, that, that's much better than doing the exercise where you say like, today, everyone with brown eyes is better than everyone with blue eyes. And you traumatize <laughs> children for a decade. Forever, right? <laughs> yeah, forever. <laughs> so, no, not I, that. I'm curious how that plays in. Because one of the well-known things that the chamber does is trying to either recruit businesses to come to Tulsa or to grow ones that are already here. So how does your work tie into that? Yeah. So um, any, anyone you ask, if you ask any of our CEOs or board members and you say, what is it you would make the difference in your company? They always say without question, uh, a highly skilled, diverse, um, educated workforce. And okay. So what does, what does that mean? Right. (laughs) How, How does that work? Well, to me, 
a lot of the work that I do is about the business case for diversity, equity, and inclusion. And the business case is it's not just the right thing to do because your heart cares about it. It's the smart and profitable thing to do. It means that you are going to really embrace your clients because you're going to be serving a wider variety. It means that people are going to feel like they belong in your workplace because you're addressing LGBTQ+, veteran, millennial age, women, gender parity, all of these things that comprise DEI, those are the things that make an employer of choice, right? You want to work at that employer that gets and manages all those things well. And so anymore, when you're a company like Amazon or Google or Zappos or whoever, you're thinking about those components to your profitability more than you are necessarily just like the bottom line of making money. And so uh, I think that's been the tie is it's not just the smart thing to do. It's the profitable thing to do for your business when you think about those things. I know I, I remember from my leadership tells, I think actually it might've been in Thrive when we actually saw a business case where they could show that a more diverse work em- employees made, mm-hmm. made more money. And I'm trying to remember what example that was, but <laughs> it was, it was not surprising when they explained the logic of it. Like yeah. diverse backgrounds means diverse life experiences, diverse yep. ideas, and yep. diverse ideas leads to new things that then right. Companies can sell or market or Absolutely. whatever companies do. And can make you more attractive to the clients that you're serving. And so all of those things are the reason that I do the work I do because I truly believe it's important. And it's the reason why maybe we didn't get um, Tesla, right? I mean, they went to Austin because Austin's weird and and this and that. And I just, not to say that we were number two, so it was a pretty good deal. But I'm just saying... Clearly, it matters to people. And a lot of people anymore are asking, what's your stance? What's your community stance on DNI? How does it impact your community? Do people value this? You're in Oklahoma. You all went red. You know, what is this? Ma-? And so I think anymore, it's very important that we have an answer to that question. And it should be that we embrace those concepts. Where did the training for this come from for you? Because I know they have they have DEI programs now and whatnot, but like I don't see that listed anywhere. So I'm very <laughs> curious about... Like, did you do it the way other jobs used to let people do, which is you learned it as you, as you went, or did Mm you, were there conferences you went to? Like, how did, how did you learn these skills? You know, lucky, lucky for me, when they, when I, like I said, I walked into work one day and they said, now you do DNI, congratulations. And I was like, oh, cause I'm black, right? Cause I live this every day. I know diversity inclusion, you know, that's not right. Well, bottom line is, is I really didn't. And it's been, it's been um, learning from my peers, you know, people like Denise Reed and Shaga and uh, there's just countless Tennille Ben. I could go on and Marcia, for gosh sake, Ashley Phillipson. These people talk, I'm, a, I'm around them, I engage with them. And so I start to learn the lingo and I, I, you know, start to think about what resources there are. And, and I engage with companies like Catalyst, which really focuses on CEO level commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion. I've been to a Catalyst conference, hosted a Catalyst conference here in Tulsa. I've been to the forum on workplace inclusion out in Minneapolis and really enjoyed that. So there's a variety of different like avenues to learn more. Uh, you can be culturally competent certified. I haven't done that, but I've been thinking a little bit about how, how important is that. I'm a little bit specialized because I'm really focused on the competitive advantage for DNI. And I'm not necessarily as interested in, I don't know, training on implicit bias. It's important. I get the value of it and I've done it. I just I just want to talk about the organizational health and you know what I mean? Like the mm-hmm. organizational piece of it and what makes a healthy employer versus necessarily just training all the time and doing inclusive language and talking about why use they over the, you know, I just, it's great. All of that's important, but I really like the businesses and really understanding what makes them tick as it relates to DNI. Mm. That's, that's executive director work. That's not what vice yeah, presidents that's, yeah, that's are, not what VPs do. Yeah. do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I just realized that I accidentally am drinking out of, I don't know if you can read it. It's my Tulsa yeah, Inspires, Inspires glass. Inspires, yes. yes. Which is uh, the from thing. the yeah, tourism. Accidentally. <laughs> I actually did do it on accident, but it's from the <laughs> tourism <laughs> Uh, department with the chamber. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you've got the tourism. Ray has got his whole with the with the sports commission as well. Mm-hmm. Um, does your work tie into that? You know, does diversity tie into the type of events we attract and, and stuff like that? 
Yeah, you know, that's been a it's been a harder question, I think, for us is like, uh, I think people silo DNI, like it's over here. It's the thing that you do separately. You have a training on implicit bias and you go because you care about it. And I think a lot of my work over the past few years was like how to integrate it across all of our work. How are we thinking about attracting companies? Um, how are we thinking about tourism? How are we promoting Greenwood and the Greenwood district or the international district out east or, you know, it, so it's been really interesting. So yes, there has been some really unique uh, collaboration between me and Ray's division and tourism, like around Juneteenth, you know, that happened kind of around Trump rally time. And, and so we were engaged together, they put on a visual Juneteenth on the TV, or they broadcast it live. So that kind of happened. And um, also had a presence at the Juneteenth we had here in Tulsa. And so I was the liaison between that, like talking to my contacts on Greenwood and talking with tourism, and how can they help? And what water can they send and all that. So it's been really interesting. Those are newer relationships and collaboration because we're still DNI in this role has only been around for two years, like solely this. And so it's been interesting trying to figure out what that is and how do we collaborate to do this work best. Cause you mentioned um, you know, how how do you promote Greenwood, right? And and now with coming up on the centennial of the race massacre, you have you know, two very big HBO shows, de- you know, depicting some of the, so it's, it's in the national consciousness more than ever before, you know, and you have all these programs in Tulsa around it. So, so I, that's something I am curious about. How do you promote it, but do it in a respectful, you know, way? Yeah. I think the way that I've taken to doing that is um, our presence. I don't think that in a, in a, in a hundred years, certainly in the engagement of North Tulsa, has the chamber ever been truly 100% present, right? And I, I serve on the Race Massacre Centennial Commission, you know, and I'm proudly there representing the chamber. I serve on the historic Greenwood Main Street District Board. I'm there as a chamber member, someone who works for the chamber and represents the chamber. I'm involved in the Met Cares Foundation. I'm in par- involved with races and stinks. So I think just presence is important because I can say, here's what I'm here hearing out in the community. Here's something that's important to the community. Here's something that we're working on, on, on this board and, and take that back to our board, um, do a presentation on it, have folks come in. It just creates relationship. And I think that's part of what we're promoting is really relationship and that we're not operating away from a community. We're trying to pull that community in and let them pull us in. I think people initially were very skeptical. Oh, you're representing the man. That's why you're here. <laughs> Um, and now I, I really, as I sat at Vanessa Hall Harper's counselor, Vanessa Hall Harper's house the other night, I was like, I've made it. I'm in. <laughs> I feel like, <laughs> wow, <laughs> I'm getting invites to the house. And I told her as much. It just feels special. Like there isn't a skeptical, why are you here? What's your motive? It feels like they really get that I do the work I do for the organization I do for the benefit of the communities that I serve. You mentioned as we are getting prepped that you had a question for us. I want to give you the opportunity to ask that question. Well, yeah, I want to know more about Pod for Good. What is it all about? Chris and I don't like talking about what we do. Um, (laughs) um, (laughs) We're very private people. Are you uh, very private? Both introverts. Yep. (laughs) So again, like this, this podcast idea came out of my Leadership Tells a Thrive class where we, you know, we had to do a project by the end. And I had a lot of big ideas at the beginning that I was never going to be able to do. And at the same time, I, the nonprofit job I had at the time sort of collapsed in on itself. And while I was figuring out what I was going to do, many intelligent people, including Marcia Bruno Todd, was like, you seem to have a skill set that people are interested in. Podcasts, you talk about it all the time. All the time. <laughs> Why don't you do something in that field? And right. I was like, huh, like as a, as a middle class white person, what could I do to help uh, the people who are working in the communities that I'm not a part of that I want, <laughs> that I want to help. And I thought of both podcasts as sort of a marketing tool, right? because as you probably know, nonprofits, not the best at marketing themselves. Nope. Uh, that's not the training they have. They have the training in the thing they're trying to fix, right. not in how to necessarily raise money or raise awareness about that. Right. And podcasts being what they are, I thought, what if I interview them, let them talk about their why, why they care, why other people should care, how people can help, that that would at least 
raise awareness. And I felt like that was the minimum thing I could do. And I asked Chris to help me because, well, Chris and I are both friends and we both care about the same things, but we come to caring about those things from two different directions. I love it. I love it. That was, that was actually a great answer, Jesse. Thank you. Uh, We got a question from uh, a fan slash our fairy godmother of this podcast, Marcia Bruno Todd, who's been mentioned many times already. So our listeners want to know, at least one listener wants to know. (laughs) What's the most embarrassing professional moment you had? And either how did you recover from it? Or what did you learn from it? Oh my gosh, that's such a good question. That's a good question. I'm I'm trying to think and I've done many embarrassing things. And I'm trying to think of which one was the most embarrassing. I feel like there's many opportunities in DEI work to say something accidentally that's embarrassing. (laughs) Now that you say that I do and I'm embarrassed to tell it but I feel like outing myself in this way is is good for my DNI and it shows you how much work yes. I have to well, do. And here's the thing. We can edit out and just send it to the person who gave us the question who gave if you don't question. want it to be aired. Okay. So before I had the role in DNI, obviously, I was working at the chamber just as a receptionist or whatever. But I, I think I was working in education, to be to be fair. And there was a time when the lottery got up like over... I don't know, a hundred million or something. And I'm just like, I'm that person to be like, put in your money. We're going in, we're going to buy a ticket. And I said something along the lines of, uh, I'm going to go to a Habib store to go get my lottery ticket in front of my Persian coworker who was horrified by the phrase. And don't think she said anything, but someone else came up to me and said that, why would you say that? And I was like, that's just what we'd always called it. You know, the, the small convenience store, that's not the quick trip, but like individually owned. And it was like, I I still feel a great sense of embarrassment for that situation that I would have made someone feel that way because I've, you know, people have said something that have bothered and hurt me, you know, colored this, or I don't know, just all kinds of little microaggressions that I, even up to that point had felt like I was beyond that. That's not something that I live because I'm black and you can't out microaggression me in terms of things that have happened to me. But that was just, it was, it made me think a lot more about the way I say things and that I too have my own biases and my own things that I say that are uncomfortable and make people feel some kind of way. And so anyway, the way I shared that, I'm happy with you guys leaving that in because it was- Um, Listen, I, Chris and I have- a multitude of stories, much more embarrassing than that. Um, <laughs> well, and so th- that leads me to another question, which is, yeah. and I, I know it's personal, is yeah. I'm, I've noticed that I become, I think, over, m- maybe overly sensitive about w- when I'm talking to either a black person or an African-American person, what they like to be referred to as. And I know yeah. it's, there's no one term. And so I have <laughs> right. to ask a said person, but I'm curious about your thoughts on that question. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm actually an African-American. My father was from Africa, born and raised, came to Tulsa, came to Stillwater, went to school at OSU. Um, But so it doesn't bother me either way. You call me black, call me African-American, it's fine. There are some people that truly are like, I have no connection to Africa. My family's from the Caribbean or like whatever. They don't make that connection. And so they don't want to be called that. And you have to respect that. I mean, sometimes... Um, do you do you want people to acknowledge your Jewishness, even though you're not like, <laughs> or I mean, the, I'm pr- I'm do you know what I'm saying? Like it, yeah. white, yeah. white Jewish person. All the time. So it's just kind of a difference in, in opinion. Some people uh, want you to respect the fact that they have that connection and they, they want to be African-American and some people don't. And so I, I go to, I'll answer to both for sure. Okay. I mean, I can tell you like as a Jewish person, it's really all about what word they use when they're describing us. Like if, if as long as they use the word Jewish, we're okay. It's when we get referred to as Jew that we're like, mm, no, really? no, no, no. Like, that's never used well. Okay. When like I, I have a Jew doctor or, you know, a Jew accountant. You're like, no, nope, no, sounds no. terrible now that you said yeah. it like that. I, I don't yeah. think I've ever referred to someone as a Jew no, doctor. No, you wouldn't because you're a decent human being. Um, <laughs> but, but I can I remember, get right? Yeah. It's like... yeah the, the last time it came up was um in the – the Doug Jones, Roy Moore Senate uh, oh, campaign because yes. his wife, his uh, his wife talked about their Jew lawyer, and I was just like, mm. oh, <laughs> no, like, yeah, you're not in, you're not down. Yeah, it's like that's not, nope. That's that, that, terrible. Oh my god, yeah. but I'm glad you said that. That's good to know. Yeah, like we want we want the descriptor term. I don't know what the English way of phrasing it is, but right, uh, yeah, it's like 
we we are also a person, not just this thing that you put in front of of other words. Person first language. <laughs> yes, yes, person first language. Got mm-hmm. it. We had a situation at work where a, a staffer called uh, our leadership uh, stale, pale, and male. <laughs> you ever heard that? No. I've not heard that before, but <laughs> and I like that. Um, and it was it was funny in the moment, but it really bothered the white men. It was really a bothersome to them because they said, "Well, we're innovative, and and we're you know that's a that's a microaggression against us. Like, how is that possible?" And I and I kind of wanted to do the fake tears, yeah, the- yeah, <laughs> <laughs> whatever. Yeah. But yeah. point made is you know as we talk about being an inclusive workplace, using language like that that alienates or makes someone feel uncomfortable is just inappropriate, and so we had to decide that we're not going to use terms like that, even though I think they were trying to showcase that, you know, they get diversity and we need to think outside of the box, but it, it bothered some people to hear it like that. So I try not so, to use that yeah. one. <laughs> so it, it, in that case, isn't that like an equity of microaggressions? Like <laughs> white men haven't got their full share of microaggressions <laughs> as other groups have, and they deserve more now. I Shouldn't know, be- right? People who are white, if we're using yes, sorry, yes. Uh, I'm sorry, you're white, right, Kirk, right. Yeah. People who are white. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, I, like I said, I wanted to kind of roll my eyes at it. But part of the thing that I have, if, if I could say that I have a superpower, is I've done so well in this work because I do my best not to come at it from a shame, a guilt, or an alienating um, angle. And so I never in trying to teach someone about how I feel like I've been treated or, or or my race has been treated or other marginalized communities, I don't ever want to marginalize in the process of teaching about it. And so I really took the comment quite seriously when, when um, the white male said that, because I don't want him to check out of the conversation. And that's typically what they would do is go, oh, well, you know, oh, what am I doing here? And then leave. And we absolutely need way more white males to help do this work because I can't do it alone, you know? And so um, they made the mess. We got it. We need them to help clean it up, essentially. <laughs> well, that that leads me to my next question, which yeah. is: How do you deal with the in- apparently incredibly fragile white male ego? It's super fragile, isn't it? What's up with that, you guys? <laughs> like, I mean, again, Chris and I don't know. Like we've like we've had horrible things said to us since we were kids. Like we are just not that I should be the one to speak to this, but I feel like there's. A, a worldview you get when you don't have to deal with these things for so long that yeah. when they're pointed out, I mean, I think Chris, you say about you say it way better than I do. It's good to be it's good to be acknowledged now again. It's it's now the white person's time to be acknowledged <laughs> for once. No, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. It, it comes back to the the when you're used to privilege, yeah. equality feels like oppression, right? I mean, it's yeah. it really is as simple as that. When yeah. when you get used to things being easier and things going your way and not having to deal with things, right? I mean, right. you talk about not coming from it from a sense of shame, right? A lot of people, when they hear things like white privilege, like, well, I didn't have this, this was tough for me, right. you know, right. and it's the idea is like, yeah, but those things that were difficult weren't because you're white, right? Right. That your difficulties, whereas other people have those difficulties <laughs> plus additional ones because of their race, their gender, their sexual orientation, whatever, right? Yeah. And so it really is, you've got this sort of world built around you and you see that you don't like to confront the fact that, you know what, maybe you did have it easier than other people, <laughs> you know, especially when we have this identity in America, especially in Oklahoma, of pulling yourself up by your bootstraps and all yes. this. Yes, yes. And when you have to confront the fact that maybe you had a little more help <laughs> then you want to yeah, acknowledge no one no one likes that right yeah no one likes to deal with that i had that experience on my um leadership tulsa the the retreat night in the mm-hmm. in the flagship class i'm spending the night there and you do this confessional thing where you do something special i can't remember mm-hmm. what it was but yeah. i had literally like five cpas that were a part of the group they were all men and maybe i had one woman and so I had like made cookies and told the story of like my mother and the cookies and all oh, and my childhood and struggle and strife and being black and all of this. And their answer to that was, oh, man, you just you just keep at it, honey. You know, <laughs> lift yourself up. You know, you're you're going to be OK. I've you know, and it was just like, this is terrible. Like, you don't even like 
get at all anything. It was just so frustrating to me that they don't get it. You know, the other part of it is I deal with it well because I'm married to a white man. So I'm, I've learned a lot by living with one who, who, who exhibits moments of a fragility on occasion. Um, most recently, you know, the murder of George Floyd happened. And in my house, Every other day for a while, there was God, white people. Oh, white people. You know what I'm saying? White people. And he was like, why do you say that with such hatred? You know, and oh, and you were do like, you think I don't I'm- know everything? <laughs> but he, he was like, do you think I'm one of them? You know, and I'm like, well, yeah, but you're cool. I mean, it, it was just, it was. He's one of the good ones. He's one yeah. of the good ones. I mean, it was just this weird, like, come on, you, you've got to know that you're somehow not in the same category, but it was really bothersome for him for me to refer to his people as Mm -hmm. in this negative sort of way. So a lot of like, Oh honey, I'm not talking about you. And I know there's good people in the world, but uh, yeah. So I, I, I have practice on the job training on that one. (laughs) It it is, it is both funny and difficult that we have to talk about a, a group of people that like, if they were not the group they were, Right. We would talk about them in different terms, but when totally. we're talking about white males in America, like there is a unequitable history that we have to deal with somehow. Yep. And it's very hard to, it's very hard to generalize because like we're trying to teach them not to generalize, but then right. we generalize because <laughs> right. in this one case it kind of works and yes. like it, it makes, it, it seems, it seems like it makes the job harder of doing right. diversity, equity, and inclusion when we have to talk about who's at fault because right. in that case we can then point to one particular group necessarily. And like, right. you're kind of the problem. Like you, not you specifically, but y'all. <laughs> y'all. Mm. y'all. <laughs> the general umbrella. Yeah. Mm-hmm. A, a, a lot more white men are getting it. I, so I don't want to say that. I mean, a lot more like, Oh God, I'm identifying my own privilege. And you know, I, I appreciate this woke language. My, my boss, I mean, he breaks it down sometimes. Uh, his name's Justin McLaughlin. He, he sometimes he just goes, Oh, like I heard that. That sounded very, you know, like he catches it. And I love that. And then there's just some that just for the for the life of them don't quite understand <laughs> um, the difference in some of these matters. So, <laughs> yeah, I, and I think it's funny. I mean, we're, you know, a couple weeks uh, from the election. So mm-hmm. seeing it in terms of voting blocks as well is always kind of interesting because oh, yeah. you do see some of the generalization. But then we're also seeing where things that used to seemingly be generalized now you can't i mean looking at the latinx vote you know there used to be a very specific thought process and how Mm -hmm. it was never really uniform people just assumed it was right right and and how different that is and then even looking at you know the white white vote how it's different men and women you know suburban urban rural and stuff like that so it is fascinating to see that it is fascinating and i'm always shocked at white women who always on the surface are very, I if say. I have a bias, it's white women. Okay. Because they will smile and we'll be girlfriends forever. And then they go and like vote against their interests in my, and from my standpoint, or just like, so they're the most, I was just shocked at how many white women voted for, for our president. It was just shocking to me. <laughs> you know, being that I feel like they're all like, we're on team Kuma diversity. We love this. And then it feels like clearly you're not. I yeah. was, <clears throat> my husband said, is it weird walking around Oklahoma knowing that over a million people voted um, against your best interests? And I thought, I'm talking to enemies all the time, aren't I? It's just like, wow. Yes, yes, you are. <laughs> yes, I am. That's why Jesse and I so, are, yeah. are afraid to leave our little bubble of midtime. Yeah. Midtime. We're in like a little <laughs> blue bubble sort yeah. of. Yeah. We're like, uh, we don't want to go. We don't want to go any further south. Uh, I know. Yeah. <laughs> Again, just... you, you, you can zoom in on those like county by county maps and pretty much pick out my dad's house in Broken Arrow as the one <laughs> little blue spot. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm just like, yep, that's his house right there. Um, yeah, you I know, mean, like it's, I said, yeah. I've got my neighbors who, you know, everyone has their different, totally wonderful people, very nice. But at the when it when you get to right down to it, you totally don't believe the same thing I do, and that's just really interesting to like mm. confront on a daily basis, and then not know on a, you know what I mean? Kind of want to know where the enemy is, not the enemy, but like where the 
I don't know. It's interesting. Yeah, like, yeah. Who do they, who do they think the enemy is? If it's like if they're right. like, well, uh, like I'm not think like I'm not talking about you, right? Like, right. well, you said your husband, but reversed. <laughs> right. uh, it's like, well, then who are you talking about? Right. right? Who, who is are we talking who is this about? other? Who's right. this? You know the, you know I mean like Antifa. Th- this, I've heard it's yeah, Antifa. Antifa. Yeah, that's what it yeah, is. It's right? obviously Antifa, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, because liberals are very good at organizing. We've oh, definitely proven that over word. and over again. We you definitely guys. can follow one person around uh, <laughs> and uh, agree on things. By the time this comes out, it'll have been like a l- little under a month from the election. Yeah. And probably less time from when it was actually called. And for some people, still hasn't been called. But those people are wrong. Um, <laughs> they are wrong. Where So um, America has had, I would say maybe four different co- four different conversations they're not having with each other over the past couple of years. Mm-hmm. But where do we go now, right? If we don't have someone who's constantly just stirring things up for reasons, uh, how do we as, as Americans like actually tr- move forward and try to have the conversations we need to have to make yeah. a more equitable society? Gosh, you're stumping me with these questions. I'm My sorry for the word. serious question. I, I don't do it often. Yeah, I wish I wish I had like a like a glass ball to tell you the answer to that. I I, I know that for the work I do at the chamber, uh, like I said, I can't change a heart and a mind. I, I just like I'm not even going to try to change a heart and a mind. My focus is on policy and practice, and to me, it's like show me the receipts. I don't care what you're saying anymore. I want to I want to know that your board is is diverse. I want to know that you're thinking about policies and practice that advance or address equity in your organization. And that's as much as I can do. On top of that, I can make you aware. I mean, you know, our board might be majority white, but by gosh, they know the difference between equality and equity. They know the definition of diversity and inclusion. They understand social justice, racial justice. So it's just like, I'm just trying to do my best to make people aware. And when I have those moments where my boss or some other white individual says, I am checking myself in this moment, I have always done this and I I'm doing something differently to me. There's the win. And hopefully if enough people start doing that, then we've got a better place. Um, so we have a lot of work to do, but I'm really hopeful. I feel like this has been the most woke America has been. Like I said, my, my white neighbor and her, you know, three kids, (laughs) you know, she's flying black lives matter flag and her bumper sticker has it. And it, it just makes me feel good. And the amount of, Biden Harris signs in the neighborhood make me feel good. And I just, at least people are open. I, mm-hmm. I feel like people are more open than ever. And that's what will lead to ultimately a better Tulsa and a better nation. Well, and one thing I will say in the, in the chamber's defense, we talked about how they have a certain, you know, image with the general population. <laughs> and I don't know if it's just a, a byproduct of the fact that they're in super red Oklahoma, but it seems like generally they are uh, promoting uh, more progressive agenda legislatively in other ways mm-hmm. than, you know, the state, especially the state government. So yeah, yeah. It, it definitely seen that over, especially recently over the last several years that they're trying yeah. to help, you know, drag, drag, uh, not just Tulsa, but Oklahoma into the, you know, 20th century as a way <laughs> to attract and retain people. Absolutely. I think my old boss, Brian Pascal, used to call it the great state of Tulsa. And he used to have a hat that said that. And um, and I used to love that because I do believe Tulsa is trying to kind of set itself apart. We we are a little bit more progressive, not totally all the way. And I, I, I don't want to disregard, you know, a conservative view or the other side. I really think that's super important. We need that tension in order to make anything work really well. But our chamber truly does get diversity, equity, inclusion They've been invested in this work way before I started doing it. And so I have seen as well their policy stances uh, be more thoughtful and intentional. Not everything goes my way. Um, I I wanted them to take a huge stand against the Trump rally coming to Tulsa on Juneteenth. Ultimately, we just decided to do no harm and not say anything about it versus coming out for or against. So sometimes you have to make these little compromises. Yeah. And they're getting bolder and not flinching about differing from the state chamber or other organizations. And honestly, when people start pulling their resources away from the chamber because of the choices we make, that's really going to be the the thing. When we are starting to like make choices that people are supporting with their money, that will be important or will go away, if that makes sense. People invest in us because they believe in us. And right now there's still a lot of resources that 
uh, use those resources to get you to go the way and make the statement they want you to do. We're getting bolder about stepping away from that. And um, I think that will attract even more resources and investment to us when we do that. <laughs> no, I mean, yeah, like the the chamber has to be able to continue to fund itself, and it can only go mm-hmm. so far before it Ab- loses. Cause absolutely. We, weirdly enough, the money in Tulsa, there's a lot of money on the progressive side too, but business wise, there's more overall businesses that have leaders and absolutely, uh, funders who are, and yeah. and we're you know. shifting a lot of them. A lot of them are already on the same mm-hmm. plane. Our board of directors very progressive. A lot of them are asking for a lot of strategy change. They just voted on equity actions that I put together just a few weeks ago. So we're going to launch in 2021 a whole new equity strategy that that our chamber board like bought into. Holy, the more of those things that happen, I think we'll we'll get to the point where we can sustain ourselves on our choices toward equity versus having to sort of count and rely on people that maybe don't believe in it as much. And and I think as with anything with businesses, the more they can see that it's good for their bottom line, any ideology starts to go out the window. Because if they can Absolutely. see that any of these policies are bringing more people to Tulsa, bringing a more diverse, educated workforce right. to Tulsa, right. giving and making more money for their companies... Right. Then you might start to see a little bit of a, a ideological swing as well. Absolutely. That's the whole bottom line. That's my work each and every day, you guys. That's that's what I'm supposed to do is get them to change their ideology because it is better for their bottom line. And so many companies are doing it. You know, we have well over 100, uh, 181 companies take our inclusive workplace index. It's something Mosaic does every year. And, you know, it just answers some of these baseline questions. Do you have a diversity statement? Do you care about this? Do you care about that? The responses are overwhelming. So people are getting it. It's just slow. Mm -hmm. They're getting it. Yeah. I know. I was excited. Uh, We started a uh, a DNI council this year um, at work. To, to try to help with it. You would you know, be okay? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And have started doing uh, communities of practice to try to promote different groups and stuff like that. Yeah. So it is, it's nice actually seeing it in action and it feels yeah. like the leadership really is. I'm not saying that it used to be lip service, but sure. you know, it sometimes feels like that. But once you yeah. see visible policies being enacted, yeah. not just statements People coming their out. Mind. Yeah. Right. It yeah. really yeah. feels like, you know, that the conversation, the everyday conversation changes around it. It's not people yeah. thinking, oh, I have to hire this number of this many people or interview that right. number of that many people. It just starts to become part of your your hiring practice, part of your mm-hmm. training practice, your promotion right. practices. Right. Because it just makes sense. They're starting right. a mentorship program. That's that's starting Yay. just early next so year. So is Janet yeah. in charge so. of your Janet Huber, is she the one re- leading your efforts? Okay. Is she, yes. is she senior vice president of DEI at Bank of Oklahoma? <laughs> <laughs> she might, she uh, might have I'm, I have to look title. to see if that's her title. But Yeah, it's yeah. something bank related. But she's passionate mm-hmm. about it. And I can't Absolutely. tell you how many conversations I've had with Steve Bradshaw and David Stratton about DNI and their commitment mm-hmm. to it. So yeah. that's really good to hear. I've been I've met Janet actually in Minneapolis at a conference. So she's going and learning as well. So mm-hmm. that's great. Yay. But that was too much be okay talk. Uh positive Sorry. be okay talk without them being a sponsor of the <laughs> podcast. Um <laughs> We normally have two sort of final questions. One of the things we ask is we want to give you a chance to sort of self-promote or plug. So are there any any upcoming well, events or causes or anything that you'd like to promote or, you know, websites, anything that you'd like to throw out as a last chance so that if people want to connect with you, sure. the Chamber or Mosaic, anything? Well, please visit mosaictulsa.com. Uh, you'll learn more about Mosaic, what we do. We meet monthly. It would be fabulous to have more people join our coalition. You know, we're really passionate about doing this work and are looking for people who have decision-making authority in the organization, again, to address policy and practice. That would be number one. But I always take passion over, over that. And so we're just looking for like-minded individuals to come join us on a monthly basis. The other thing is the centennial is coming up for the 1921 race massacre and getting involved, giving time to the communities that uh, was affected, North Tulsa, engage in one of the any of the organizations I mentioned, Greenwood Main Street, the centennial itself. 
um, any organization or giving or any of the businesses on Greenwood, support them with your dollars because we want Tulsa to look and feel very different than it did 100 years ago. And it will take all of us engaging and being in the community to really make it look different. And so um, I want us to feel like things have changed since 100 years ago. And they're not a sponsor either, but uh, if you want some good food, Wanda J's, they're, they're still great. Ooh, it's, an, mm. it's the, it's the new generation. You know, if you want, if you want the original Wanda J's. This they, man knows what he's talking about. Yeah. They're still, very good. But, but the, <laughs> yeah, Wanda J's is great. I don't, you don't care. You want to get their daily special. You want to go for their, their fried chicken, the, the, everything. Uh, uh, it's, they're, they're good. Listen, I'm, I'm going to edit all that out. No one gets <laughs> on. to see here. <laughs> I'm not, why do you, I'm not running why do you, why are a free you opposed advertising to, agency. Why are you opposed to, to businesses on Greenwood, Jesse? Why are you opposed to that? <laughs> you, you don't think I'm going to add that out? Uh, I'll, I'll cut out the first part, but leave that in? Come on, man. That's so good. <laughs> yeah, no funny. businesses ever. <laughs> so it, it, it's funny. It's like post-election, like the pandemic feels different to me, even though I know it's not. Like Tulsa's, Tulsa's going through, I don't know, wave number four i I, i've lost count if you never fix anything isn't it still just the first wave it's still the first wave right we never did anything right no well (laughs) someone made a comment about there's a woman in oklahoma city who apparently has gotten the coronavirus three times and someone uh when i mentioned that was like is it possible she's just had it the whole time and i was like (laughs) fair fair. point well taken yeah point well taken (laughs) During this pandemic, where we've all had to sort of readjust how we work, how we interact with our family and friends, what have you found? And th- this is not about like how you've worked during the uh, the pandemic. This is how you how have you relaxed? How have you stayed sort of centered? Like, do mm. you have some sort of like uh, pop culture comfort food, as we call it, like a thing that you like to watch or something you like to read or a game you like to play <laughs> to wind down from all the insanity that has been twenty twenty. You're going to laugh so hard at this. Yes. I've been watching Forged and Fire on Netflix. And it's all about people forging me- knives yes. and blades I, and stuff. I saw that. I know, that uh, popped uh, up yes, as like a recommended yes. show for me. I was wondering you what guys, that was. It is riveting. I have all watched. Right. I have like, I have blazed. Just to mindlessly watch these guys hammering away at steel <laughs> and like this like hot fire. I told my husband I want to start a forge like in the garage. Like I am that committed to forging fire. It has been like my thing for the past few days. Oh, yeah, um, I, I, like, as two I people assumed, who like, have been that, super into yeah. like uh, fantasy books and shows, I feel like that. I be was right gonna up say, our- like, is it just like a montage of like Lord of the Rings sword scenes? And <laughs> oh my it's, god! Sounds like it is. It's so funny. Well, they they get to first make a knife of their choice, but then they give them a historical weapon that they oh, have to recreate. Awesome. And that's when they get into Viking axes and <laughs> Japanese yes. maitake swords and all this crazy stuff. Oh my oh, god, wow. you guys! Please give that to watch okay. it's giving oh, me so I much will. joy yeah we will we and will. then uh i've been making charcuterie trays i've been buying cheeses and meats and like <laughs> I love making it. my little platter <laughs> i love it i i saw i saw i think it was a facebook picture yeah. of, like a tray you did over the weekend and yeah. i was like yep. that's a good looking tray you guys I know what it, for, I, I, that's it my seems life. like a lot of people have gotten super into charcuterie during the I'm pandemic because i've gotten into it too i don't know is it just a thing you're like, I don't know. It's I'm like an adult, grazing. and if it's I want to like... just eat meat and cheese, I can kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it's a fancy way of just snacking. Right. Snacking. Right. And I've made a full meal. Fancy like, snacks. I've made it dinner. Yeah. It's so fantastic. So I make my own cherry limeades with uh, oh. Luxardo, pomegranate syrup, and Topo nice. Chico at oh. my charcuterie tray, and I watch Forge and Fire. That's how I'm surviving the pandemic right now. That's that amazing. sounds that, awesome. I wish the, the pandemic was over so we could come over and join you because that hey, just yeah. sounds Anytime. like a great time. <laughs> yeah. We, we, Chris and I could bring our wep- our uh, fantasy weapons that we own over. I would love to see them. I am so geeked about them, you guys. I know all these hamon and all of these, like the, you know, the all of these terms. I love it. That's awesome. Amazing. That sounds amazing. <laughs> Kuma, I want to thank you for joining us on the podcast and thank for you. letting me deliver uh, a microphone to you twice this week. And <laughs> uh, how do I get it back to you? <laughs> the, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that often. Okay, sorry. Um, it's just, it's just give me another trip to your house. <laughs> okay. um, just sit here my friend outside somewhere. holding it, yeah. and Jesse will run yeah. past him and grab it out of his yeah, hand. Like, I won't even slow down. I'll just grab it out of his hand. <laughs> 
Uh, but thank you so much for joining us. Like this has been thank you. Uh, both a fascinating conversation and fun. <laughs> yeah. And good. I don't think this became a pod for sad episode once. So Yay, no we've, pod we've for broken sad. the streak. We've broken the streak. <laughs> so uh, thank you so much. And, you know, uh, enjoy your evening of uh, charcuterie yes. boards and uh, weapons. Thank you all for listening to our conversation with Kuma Roberts. Please check out Mosaic. The link will be in the show notes. They are also on Facebook. And speaking of Facebook, please follow Pod for Good there. We're also on Instagram and the Twitter. And of course, please subscribe and leave a review if you can. And as always, Tulsa, get it done. And for the love of all that is holy, wear a mask. Wear a mask.